Okay, yeah, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Peter Newell, I'm from the uh, University of Sussex and I'm one of the co-organisers of today's event. And it's great to see so many people here. This event has been hugely oversubscribed and I'll take that as a positive thing in, uh, in these times that people still want to talk about rapid and progressive changes towards a more sustainable uh, society. Um, now today's um, event is the latest, but, um, but hopefully not the last, in a, a series of ongoing events that uh, Andrew Sims over there and I have been organising over the last 18 months or so. Uh, we've had events at the Centre for Alternative Technology in Wales, in uh, Uppsala, in Sweden, in the Tyndall Centre in Manchester, in Oxford, the Hay Festival, Dartington Hall, numerous places, diverse places. Um, really have a series of conversations and dialogues about this question of, of rapid transition. Um, and in developing this agenda and trying to initiate this conversation, uh, we were taking on a huge task. We were trying to think about lessons from the past about when large-scale, disruptive, transformative change has occurred before and what, if any, lessons it might hold for the current predicament that we find ourselves in. Um, so we're wanting to look at the transformative, the rapid, but also equitable and inclusive processes. And of course, there's many trade-offs uh, around trying to meet all of those criteria uh, simultaneously, and no doubt we'll touch on those themes as we move through the day. But we thought it was timely to initiate this uh, conversation, given the huge potential for feeling overwhelmed and disempowered by the scale and complexity of the financial, climate, energy, food crisis, and the links between those things, and the staggering responsibility that current generations are shouldered with to try and address these issues for which few precedents uh, appear to, to exist. And so today we're launching this, uh, what used to be called a pamphlet, could be a booklet now, this, this publication that you've uh, received a copy of on the way in, hopefully, uh, to, try and, to try and do this, to try and stimulate the conversation about learning from the past and reflecting on current needs to accelerate the transitions and transformations towards a more sustainable society. And you'll find in it lots of <coughs> examples, anecdotes, stories, research, um, drawn from all sorts of sectors and regions of the world and from different historical periods touching on these questions. Now, of course, direct parallels uh, with the wicked problems we face today and the confluence of economic, ecological and social crises are, of course, limited. But we argue there's plenty that can be learned about how radical and disruptive change can be built from below, initiated from above, and cultured in lots of different ways. And so for us, I think, Andrew's going to say more about this in, uh, uh, later on, this gives us real cause for hope. It shows how resilience and the ability to adapt to events is the norm, how seemingly powerful, intransigent, incumbent interests can be overcome, how shocks and crises often stimulate positive change, despite their short-term pain and disruption. So this isn't a manifesto. It's a call to engage in a conversation about the present, present predicament we face, but to do it in a more historically informed, historically literate and informed way. Uh, it's not a blueprint, it's not a vision, but it does seek to, to bust some of the myths that surround uh, these, these sorts of conversations, that we can't engage in a process of, of more rapid transition or transformation for a series of reasons that often get wheeled out around the inability of the state to take the lead, about people's willingness to engage in, in transformation, um, about the lack of finance, which is uh, said to inhibit our ability to deal with these challenges in more effective ways. Um, and in any case, we have the available smart technolo uh, technological fixes that can address this issue. In other words, there's no need to uh, deal with change in any other arena of life. So this is just some background to what we're talking about today. You've all got a copy of the, the programme. I'll briefly talk you through what we're trying to do today. Uh, in a moment, we'll hear from our local MP, Caroline Lucas, uh, to give us a few uh, words of, of welcome. Um, we're then going, we'll hear a bit more from Andrew about the pamphlet and some of the examples and themes that I've just been introducing. Um, and then we've got a panel made up of people that actually engaged in many of these change processes from, di from very different angles. Um, Rob Hopkins talking about the Transition Town Movement, uh, Molly Collins will be talking about cultural dynamics of, of transition. Uh, Jasmine uh, Hyman from Yale on the politics of rapid agenda, drawing on the experience of the Tea Party. Uh, Paul Allen here from Centre for Alternative Technology on Innova Innovation um, and Financing Infrastructural Shifts. And Phil Johnson from Science Policy Research Unit at Sussex talking about the role of the state in transitions. 
Uh, we've then got a one hour lunch break. The food will be provided by the Real Junk Food Project, a really interesting local initiative trying to avoid food waste. Um, and then the afternoon switches a bit more to networking, um, building activities, making linkages uh, across the different activities and initiatives and organisations that many of you here in the room uh, represent. Um, so we've got a shout out session where we want to hear from you about what you're doing, the challenges you're facing and how we might uh, move forward. And then after the tea break, a session getting a bit more specific about what are the concrete ways in which we might be able to work together to build this platform, to carry on the conversation, to try and get some funding to, do, to uh, carry on these sorts of activities uh, and exchanges. And then after a brief report back, there's going to be drinks and some music uh, later on. So that's sort of the format uh, for the day. Um, just before I hand over to Caroline, I wanted to say a few thanks uh, to Harriet Dudley, first of all, who's here somewhere, or possibly outside, and Parveen from Step Centre, who's been busy uh, organising this. Nathan, who's been doing a lot of the, the comms work, who's sat over there. Uh, to Andy Sterling and Ian Schoons, who uh, supported this idea and put money behind it from the Step Centre at Sussex, which has been working on these issues of sustainability and different pathways to sustainability and the politics of them uh, over a, for more than 10 years now. So do visit the STEPS website. There's a great you know, variety of research and resources there that inform many of the conversations that we'll be having today. But I really want to say, finish by just saying thanks to all of you for being here. I think it's now more than ever important and timely that we have these uh, sorts of conversations. Very briefly before I hand over to Caroline, just to say fire exits uh, at the back there and through these doors here, toilets out to the left and around the corner. Uh, so without further ado, I'd invite uh, Caroline Lucas, our wonderful local MP, to come and say a few words of, of welcome to all of us uh, before I hand over to Andrew. Um, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be here today and it's a real honour to welcome you to the heart of my constituency, Brighton Pavilion, as you'll see the sun shines because it always does in Brighton, and you're all uh, enormously welcome. Now, I've always thought that Andrew had a knack of good timing, and I'm quite sure that he had a sense that something was going to be happening just around now that no one else had a sense of. <laughs> I think even before Theresa May went on that fateful walk with Philip, and I think in brackets, let's make a note to ourselves to always be aware when our Prime Minister's going for walks with their husbands or wives. Before it was even a glint in Theresa May's eye, I think Andrew himself knew that today we would be more or less at the start of a country-defining general election when scarcely more has ever been at stake. And I would argue that the context in which this meeting is happening today makes it even more important, even more resonant, even more vital that you're here. Because we do have, in a sense, I think the country at a crossroads, and there seem to be two very clear paths going one way and another. And at the risk of being very slightly part of political, I think there's an awful lot at stake if we go down a path of extreme Brexit out of the single currency, out of the customs union, potentially losing key social and environmental protections, add to that some very extreme social policies. I mean, it seems extraordinary that we are the fifth or sixth richest country in the world, and yet we are facing a prospect of five million children living in poverty by 2020. And that's before we even get to the environmental crisis. And not just this government, but other governments who have been intent on fracking or more fossil fuel subsidies. We've heard uh, just recently that the Green Investment Bank is going to be scrapped. That engine for the green economy that could have done so much is now going to be flogged off into the private sector and potentially losing its green credentials. So that is the rather grim um, context, I would say, for this conference. <clears throat> but that's what makes the other thing Andrew is so good at so important. And what he's really good at, and what Peter's really good at as well, is generating hope. Not um, blind, wishful thinking, but evidence-based, radical hope. And I think that's what this conference is about and that's what this report is about. And it gives me an excuse, really, to share a favourite quotation about hope from the ever-inspirational Neil Lawson, who I think might well be joining you this afternoon. And even better, simultaneously, it allows me to shamelessly promote a new book. And Andy won't mind because he's represented in that new book, so that's ticking all the boxes, really. But I co-edited a book of essays called The Alternative, in which both uh, Andrew and Neil Lawson had a, had a chapter. But in Neil's chapter, Neil Lawson from Compass, he writes this, Hope is utopian, wistful even, but it radiates, energises and directs us precisely because it is grounded in an instinct and an analysis that allows the desirable 
to become the feasible. And if we ever needed the desirable to become the feasible, it is right now. And it also, if you can indulge me, allows me to share my other favorite quote from Rebecca Solnit on hope. And she says, hope is an ax you break down doors with in an emergency, because hope should shove you out of the door, because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of the Earth's treasures, from the grinding down of the poor and the marginal. Hope just means another world might be possible, not promised, not guaranteed. Hope calls for action, and action is impossible without hope. And so that seems to be another conclusion I would draw at least from this report, that these case studies give us radical hope, but they are also a call to action. This isn't an academic debate, as I know you know uh, more than I do, but this is about filling our tanks, filling our hearts, filling our spirits with radical hope because there is so much to be done out there and we're going to need all of the hope and support and evidence that we can get in terms of making those huge strides towards radical and, and rapid transitions that we, that we need. Now this report contains hugely valuable lessons from examples of rapid change that have happened before, from the response to the Icelandic volcano back in 2010 when businesses and individuals basically had to find a new way of travelling almost overnight because all air travel was stopped, to the way that Cuba responded to its enforced isolation with that remarkable, productive set of new food systems. And I know Andrew, Andrew and Peter will talk through the case studies in the report in just a moment, but I just wanted to highlight one of them that I've done a bit of work on before, and that was around how Britain mobilised during the Second World War. And in, in the interest of food security, dependence on food imports halved between 1939 and 1943. Now that's the space of just one parliament now, if we still have fixed term parliaments. Um, and in that period, food imports halved. Allotment numbers more than doubled. 10,000 miles more land was brought into production. And yes, there was food rationing, but in the spirit of this report's conclusions that pleasant surprises often happen, actually what happened through food rationing was that the nation's health improved. And yes, while domestic coal use was cut by a quarter in the six years between 1938 and 44, interesting news is that spending on amusements went up 10%. And if ever the government might just learn something from its austerity program, it might just be that there's plenty that one can invest in that is not about expensive things, but it is about people's quality of life and how they come together. So looking back on what made some of these remarkable changes possible, I think one thing is clear that there was a requisite for a shared understanding of threat. And I think that is um, what we need to try to understand how we can best generate now, not in a negative, terrified way, but just in that sense of a shared understanding of the challenge that we face. Because I think one of the kind of elements we're, we're currently struck with at the moment is the fact that we're in that catch-22 of people thinking that, well, if things were as bad as the environmentalists say, then the government would be doing something, and they're not, so it can't be. And the government's thinking, if things are that bad, then people will be lobbying us more, and they would make us feel bolder to take more action, and they're not, so we won't. And so we seem to be cut in that, that, that catch-22 where we're not seeing the urgent action that is so necessary. And so I think one of the big challenges that I imagine might well be touched on as, as you go through this day will be about how we build that shared understanding of the nature and the scale of the challenge, as well as how we then respond to it. And I just wanted to end with a reflection about uh, a, a rapid transition that, that I would like to see, preferably in the next six and a half weeks. Um, and that is not, not a, a narrow party political point, but it is a bigger party political point about saying that our political system is broken. No matter what your party politics are, a system that gives government, absolute government, to any government on the basis of 24% of the eligible vote, fewer than a quarter of the people who are able to vote, seems to me to be, to be wrong. And I think in the, in the spirit as well of, of seeing some seeds of hope, I think it is exciting now that that whole debate about progressive alliances, about perhaps having different ways of doing politics in the greater, wider, common good, is something that is being seeded. And, and maybe it won't happen fast enough for, for a genie eight, but nonetheless, I do feel that there are now debates going on about how we do politics in this country that are something that I've not seen before, and I think from that also we can take some hope. Well, Caroline, thank you so much, and um, uh, just to make all the quotes about hope up into a trio, um, I'll, I'll give you my favourite one, which I've been <coughs> labouring to death so much that it's uh, I've almost worn it out over the last few years, and that's from the brilliant um, Welsh academic Raymond Williams, 
um, who was a very, very early one on the scene on the agenda of ecology and social justice, um, the whole red-green sort of uh, alliance. And he said that to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing, um, which has stayed with me and resonates, I think, rather nicely. So you organize an event on, um, on rapid transition, and then everything goes into changes overnight. It was, as Caroline said, almost as if we saw it coming. Oh, the other thing I should have pointed out that Peter didn't mention in his uh, introductory remarks is that um, if you want to be part of the, um, the, the movement for rapid transition and you're a bloke, obviously you have to wear a waistcoat. We, we didn't speak to each other um, this morning by phone, but we will phone in next time. Um, so that's, we don't need a uniform, but if you want one, there it is. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to really briefly say a few things um, about the um, pamphlet so you don't feel that you have to kind of speed read it in civil service style um, before we get into the meeting today. Um, and it's very much about, as Caroline said, we're caught in this loop where the politics is such that if the message isn't coming from the masses to the politicians, the politicians don't feel the need to send the signals so that there's no pressure from the masses, etc., etc. But there's other ways in which we've become sort of stuck, we've become caught in a process of path dependency, as a, to use that lovely phrase which um, academics like, like, like using. And this happens in a number of ways. And we build an infrastructure which locks us into high carbon use. We built a culture which locks us into high consumption. And we built an economic system which designs out the feedback loops that we would need to be making the changes at the speed and scale that the science is telling us is necessary. So the question that, to which we've addressed ourselves is how can we possibly overcome that? And what we wanted to do, and what today is just part of the process of, is to build a bigger conversation, have more people talking about what are the dynamics of rapid change, rapid transition, and to try and keep that in view. Because even though in this um, pamphlet it's the most cursory of glances through a highly selective history, and I'm perfectly aware that there are dozens of other examples that we could have looked at, um, that the biggest insight is we're actually a lot better at making rapid changes than day-to-day -day commentary and political foot tracking would have us believe. And in a hugely wide range of circumstances. So um, there's a kind of a gnomic uh, uh, phrase from a, a Russian um, medievalist that we uh, came across in the process of, of doing this, which goes along the lines that um, history teaches us nothing but punishes us for not learning its lessons. So we thought we should at least try and learn some of its lessons. And just very, very quickly, and uh, these really do just kind of scratch the surface, it kind of looked at a few examples about how adaptive people have been in different circumstances, how we've been able to change the sort of physical infrastructure of the world around us, and how in compressed periods of time we've been able to make some quite radical changes in the economy. So in terms of how we've changed, Caroline mentioned the, the, the volcano um, example, the unpronounceable Icelandic volcano. If anybody can pronounce it, you win a prize today. Anybody? Icelandic speakers, perhaps. Um, because there you had a lifeline of the global economy that we were told we couldn't live without. And yet literally overnight, people found other ways to get around, to network, and in one case, even to run a country via an iPad from the UN um, building and the, com and the country was in Scandinavia. Um, in other ways, in terms of other things that we take for granted, like the shapes of our working week, whether it is the way that in a fairly short period of time it became the social norm in a country like the Netherlands for men and women to work shorter than the conventional five-day working week, or whether in the example of the height of the financial crisis in Utah in the United States, the whole public sector was put onto a shorter working week and people adapted and things did not fall apart and people discovered other better quality of life ways of handling their time. Or when culture shifts, the, uh, um, so funny, kind of that as a reference point when you, when you think about um, when states uh, pump out their messages, we think in terms of kind of propaganda 
um, when the private sector does it on behalf of kind of consumerism and materialism, we don't think about it as propaganda, we think about it as advertising. Um, and something that we seemingly now cannot live without. But in a whole range of places, from Sao Paulo in Brazil to Grenoble um, and Chennai in India, they are experimenting with reducing the visual pollution of advertising in public places, um, changing the sort of foundations, some of the cultural foundations. Um, the speed of this new movement, and that doesn't even kind of begin to scratch the surface of behavioural changes where there is a good body of research on things like um, smoking and drink driving and, 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 and sexism and our use of language. We've got new movements. Um, we'll be hearing later from Rob Hopkins, the Transition Town Movement, the Latin American broad equivalent, the Buen Vivir Movement. Um, we'll be hearing about uh, new movements perhaps on uh, the other side of the um, um, political uh, spectrum, the, the Tea Party, and how they were able to kind of uh, engineer a flip uh, in a very short period of time in the dynamics of the political settlement. And in terms of changing the physical infrastructure of the world, we've looked at, I think the, the, I looked, the last time I looked at it, the number of homes built in England by local authorities in a year was about 1,300. Um, when Britain was still recovering from the long legacy of the Second World War in the, in the 60s, under both Labour and Tory administrations. Local authorities were building over 200,000 homes a year. That's something with all our wit and wealth and resources today we seem to have become incapable of doing and we still have a housing crisis in Britain. So look a little bit at that. We look at the speed with which new transport infrastructures were built in Victorian Britain. Looked at the speed with which the US rolled out its interstate highways program. Um, looked at the dramatic growth of renewable energy infrastructures. The classic case in Denmark, more recently in China. In fact, globally now, as the prices of solar power fall off a cliff, and we'll probably hear a little bit from Paul um, Allen about that. Caroline mentioned the moment at the end of the Cold War when Cuba lost access to um, cheap Soviet oil, whilst at the same time facing uh, economic embargoes, and how from the community up, it wasn't a state-led thing initially. There was an almost overnight revolution <coughs> in urban organic horticulture that kept a population fed. Um, more recently, in terms of the economy, just think back to what is now almost um, a, a decade ago when our financial system um, fell apart. Quite predictably, if you were listening to the few unregarded commentators who were pointing it out. And overnight, we went from uh, well, in 2006, Gordon Brown boasted about how he resisted the siren calls to re-regulate the banks and how the city was Britain's shining gift to the world of economic efficiency. Um, it wasn't long before the almost unimaginable happened when Britain's major high street banks were de facto nationalised and we did that other thing which we were always told was impossible, pumped hundreds of billions of pounds into the economy via banks, unfortunately, not done in a creative way, could have been done in a very different way, and something that we've argued for in terms of achieving low carbon infrastructure, that almost anything was possible when the moment was right and the configuration was there. We also, uh, as we're approaching, rapidly approaching Donald Trump's 100 days, I don't think he's yet managed to get a single piece of new legislation through in the States. Um, and um, it's uh, interesting to note that uh, um, um, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, I think, got through about 15 major legislative plans in his first, uh, in his first 100 days, which included major public works, included environmental works, included house building, all sorts of things. Um, an interesting, again, a period which led to a rapid compression in income inequality and in gender inequality as well. Interesting examples. Caroline mentioned Iceland. Britain's own post-Cold War experience of industrial conversion. There's a little bit about that in the report, and Caroline talked about the um, what, what was it to report with the New Home Front, which looked at um, the much more textured experience of how hard it was to achieve things in Britain during the Second World War, but how it laid the foundations for the post-war social contract, created the NHS, all those other things, and many other interesting things happened. I'm going to give you one quote, um, because I like it very much, from John Maynard Keynes, writing in 1938. Um, and when he said, if only we could tackle the problems of peace with the same energy and wholeheartedness as we tackle those of war, 
Defence is old established as a proper object for the state, whereas economic well-being is still a parvenu. Love the use of the word parvenu. Um, so that's just kind of a kind of a whirlwind tour of a few examples. And what we sort of looking at them all together, obviously they're hugely diverse, but there is, even at this stage in looking at these few examples, some sort of pattern begins to emerge about how when you're approaching rapid transition, and this was the case in Britain in the Second World War, the introduction of rationing, for example, that fairness, some very demonstrable fairness, really matters when you're going through a process of rapid change. Um, that when you do start working together at the civil society level, um, incredible things become possible. Um, and this one big insight that we're actually much better at achieving rapid change than we give ourselves um, credit for. Public leadership really, really matters. That in terms of sending the signals for resource conservation, for example, in Britain during the Second World War, it really mattered that the public buildings loudly declared the energy savings and the resource savings that, that they were making so that it was felt that everybody was, in that much abused phrase, in it together. Um, but obviously, that there's no one pathway for doing this, that it works differently in different cultural circumstances, different historical circumstances. Um, but uh, the, where there is a top-down approach to change, that equitable and inclusive change is incredibly important. Boldness is good. Boldness matters. I think um, we're in the Friends Meetings House, not, not, not a failing meeting house, so we, I think we've gone beyond um, the uh, adage of the inevitability of gradualism. I think we have to be a little bolder than that today, um, hence uh, talking about rapid transition. It's important also to connect actions with reason so that there is a felt and understood motivation why something is changing. But equally, as people might fear change, that inaction costs, that, um, as Caroline said, there's always emergent consequences, unexpected emergent happenings from the process of change, but the pleasant surprises do happen. Agitation, vital, is always necessary. And interestingly, The Economist writing about Keynes' role in terms of mobilising finances for the war in the 30s, they said possibly one of the most important things he did was to agitate, agitate around Whitehall. Um, and that once we accept those critical boundaries, um, very importantly in the climate sense, that enormous amounts of innovation get triggered. Um, so our ambition now is to grow this conversation. And um, we want to explore ways in which we can more effectively share resources, the activities, all the different groups working on this, and to keep a live dialogue um, going. Uh, I want to finish with um, uh, a corrective on another quote. You see it all over the place. Um, it's attributed, or was attributed, um, to Goethe. And it seemed to apply very much to the exercise that we find ourselves caught in. Um, and that is to the effect of whatever you can do or dream you can begin it, because boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. As is so often the case, with really nifty quotes like that that seem to work in so many different circumstances, it's misattributed, or rather, it's made up with only a very loose association with what Goethe wrote about in Faust. I can tell you that it actually comes from W. H. Murray's book, The Scottish Himalaya Expedition, 1951. <laughs> so even though it wasn't Goethe, I think it kind of still applies. Because he was talking about the way that they stumbled rather haphazardly towards this great expedition. As it feels like we've got a bit of a mountain to climb, I thought I'd just read you this one paragraph. I rather like it. It goes like this. But when I said that nothing had been done, I erred in one important matter. We had definitely committed ourselves and were halfway out of our ruts. We had put down our passage money, booked a sailing to Bombay. This may sound too simple, but is great in consequence. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always in effectiveness, concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, the providence moves too. 
a whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favour all manner of unforeseen incidents, meetings and material assistance, which no man could have dreamt would have come his way. Mr Murray's words, and I feel that kind of catches the spirit of the haphazard way in which we need to make our own mark. <laughs> so uh, thanks for that, and we're going to move smoothly and swiftly straight into the next session. Um, I'm going to chair it. Our speakers are going to give us about seven minutes each, and we've got lots of time for conversation. Um, because it's the Friends Meeting House, normally when I do this, I have kind of a, a brutal school bell that travels around with me, that um, brings people off, even if they're in mid-sentence, if they break the golden law of respecting democratic airtime. But I thought, because we're in the Friends Meeting House, I should be a little bit more gentle today. So I brought a prayer bell instead. <laughs> so when you get to your seven minutes, you'll get something like that. It, it just, it's quite beautiful, actually. It kind of goes on and on and on. Um, Paul knows all about these. He, he, uh, the Centre for Alternative Technology, you can, you can have a, a, literally a sound bath um, in about 30 different sized versions of this. Uh, so if I can invite our other speakers to come up and join us. I'm not sure if Rob's got here yet. He's coming um, on the line with me with shortly. feedback accelerated transition is happening around us now. It's not something from the past, it's something that's been happening over the past 40 years since CAP began and since the beginning of solar and wind technology. And it's a sort of virtuous feedback cycle. Kickstart support, increased mass deployment, greater economies of scale, manufacturing improvements, increased competition, technology improvements have resulted in falling costs. So, dramatic increases in scale. I mean, I've been working in renewables for 30 years. I never imagined we would see such incredible increases in scale. Um, renewables met 90% of new electricity demand increases. The world now adds more renewable power capacity annually than it adds net capacity from all fossil fuels combined. The 2015 PV market was nearly 10 times the world cumulative market of a decade earlier. More than half the wind power that is in that has been installed in the past five years. And wind gets bigger. There are now orders on the books for seven and eight megawatt turbines, 10 to 20 megawatt offshore turbines being discussed. And the costs are therefore falling. I mean, hydro, geothermal, and some biomass have been cost competitive with fossil fuels for a while. And in favorable circumstances, onshore wind and PV, even without accounting for the externalised costs of fossil fuels that nobody pays, the costs of hidden subsidies and the costs of the need for future adaptation. So costs are falling more rapidly than anybody expected. Uh, wind has decreased by 35% between 2008 and 2015. Similar time, solar PV has dropped by about 80%. So the, the shape of these graphs is, is astounding and uplifting. Looking at since CAT was founded in 1975, $101 per installed watt, and now it's sort of like 61 cents <coughs> for solar PV. Similar wind, as the costs fall through all of the feedbacks, then it reaches a certain tipping point, and installed capacity, which is the red, it begins to go up. So we're getting incredible cheaper and cheaper prices. I mean, I've been looking at some of the most uh, record low bids that are out at the moment. The Abu Dhabi Water and Electricity Authority received six bids for a 350 megawatt PV plant. The lowest bid came in at 2.42 US cents per kilowatt hour, which is astounding. So renewables are now cost competitive with fossil fuels in many markets, and have certainly moved from alternative technology into the mainstream. And the world is gearing up to making plans. We're now looking at uh, around the world, there's uh, 173 countries have renewable energy targets, and an estimated 146 countries have renewable energy support policies. And the number of models around the world is increasing, the number of people mapping out what it would be like to do this. We pulled together a report called Who's Getting Ready for Zero in the run up to Paris. And 
we found a hundred scenarios of uh, different countries around the world, from uh, sort of Costa Rica, Danish, German, American, absolutely fascinating. And by the end of uh, 2015, 110 national state providers had feed-in tariffs and 64 had an alternative energy tenders. By the end of 2015, 146 countries around the world had enacted some kind of energy efficiency policy and 128 countries had enacted energy efficiency targets. So the trend is our friend. It's very exciting to see a lot of this. The new renewables are increasingly competing head-to-head -head with fossil fuels, which is attracting wider investment. Uh, global investment in renewables reached a new high. In 2014, it was $273 trillion US dollars. Now it's $285.9 trillion US dollars, far exceeding the $130 billion. Uh, $285.9 billion, that is, not trillions. And the $130 billion allocated to new coal, gas, and fire. So renewables is out of the coal. So, it's the first time really to recognize that uh, the investment is moving from the mainstream. All sorts of conventional investors, conventional banks are moving into renewables, and all sorts of new investment vehicles, green bonds, crowdfunding, yield codes are emerging that is pulling the money in that we need for this transition. And new business models are emerging all the time, particularly in the majority world, where we're beginning to see the demand for energy is going up. So solar-powered mini-grids uh, built around the phone tower because it, the PVs are there to power the mobile phone tower, but that then leads to uh, sort of uh, local grid systems for local villages. But also thinking about the things like virtual private wire networks. We're pioneering five models in Wales looking at how you can sell energy from a community-owned hydro to the people around you at a better price. So the energy sprung people are looking at refurbishing houses in such a way as it can be done within 10 days. The residents don't have to move out, and householders then have an energy contract similar to their pre-retrofit bill, which pays off the cost of doing it. So it's, by some counts, we're sort of getting there. Energy emissions stalled during 2014 and 2050, even as the global economy grew. It's sort of leveling off due to these factors. But if we're looking at where we need to be, we've got about 18 years of emissions as usual, according to the Mercator Institute's calculator, before we've burned all the fossil fuels we can safely burn. So we need to accelerate that. What we're looking at is something peaking round about 2020, which means that it doesn't just have to stall, it has to begin declining. So we need to think, get our foot on the accelerator. What are the things that we need to accelerate? And that means thinking about the systemic, systemic shifts that can fund more of this positive feedback, and particularly thinking about not just what's been said, but who's saying it, and what is the full levelized cost of all energy choices, because we're still locked in to some historic ways of thinking. But the IMF working paper 2015 calculated that about 500, 600 billion per annum is hidden subsidies, but then the cost actually rises to 5.3 trillion if you include the costs of damage from pollution, climate change, back to there. If you add those costs, those externalized costs to the cost of fossil fuels, then renewables does very well indeed. And I was listening to Nicholas Stern the other day, who was just saying, that since the Stern report came out, the costs of inaction have proved bigger, faster, and higher than he imagined. And the cost of doing things differently have actually come down radically. And even in the 10 years following the Stern Review, preview prices fell to one-tenth of what they were beforehand. So we've got another industrial revolution. We've had mechanization, electrification, digitization. Now decarbonization is becoming another industrial revolution. That so was four, seven minutes and one second, Paul. <laughs> If anybody can beat that, then there's, there's another prize. Um, but one thing I forgot to mention is that there is a little sign outside the door that says, um, please switch your mobile phones off. But you don't have to amongst friends here. And what we didn't mention was, yes, we are terribly modern, even though we're in the French meeting house. There is a hashtag for today, if you would like to tweet or whatever, um, which is quite simply rapid transition. Um, so feel free to do that. Um, with that, I am now going to invite my good friend and colleague, Rob Hopkins, to say a few words about the transition plan movement. Good morning. Um, 
I, uh, about six years ago, I got a call from an organization in London who supports social entrepreneurs. They said, you are a social entrepreneur, and uh, we'd like you to come up and uh, present what you do, and then if we like what you do, then we'll give you support in different ways with marketing and so on. So I went up and I gave my 15-minute presentation, and when I finished it, there was a long silence. And then this guy said, so what you've done, basically, is create a very powerful brand and giving it away for free to people all over the world over whom you have absolutely no control. So yeah, that is exactly what we've done. Yeah. So that's, that's really the story that I'd like to tell you in my six and a half remaining minutes, is to kind of give you a flavor of, uh, of what that looks like. So we started Transition in about 2005. We just celebrated the kind of roughly the 10th anniversary of it in Totnes. And I guess we were inspired by David Fleming, uh, who many of you would, would, will remember, who used to say, large-scale problems do not require large-scale solutions, they require small-scale solutions within a large-scale framework. And so our, our, our approach has been, how can we, what can we start now? It's not all that we need. Obviously, we need government stuff and business stuff and all kinds of other stuff. But what can we do here now in this place? With the people we have around us, with the resources that we have, if we don't wait for anyone's permission, what can we actually get on and do? So there are now transition groups in 50 countries, thousands of places where this is happening. Uh, and I want to just share some of the kind of principles that underpin it, I suppose. So the first one is that we really respect resource limits. Uh, and, and look at creating resilience. And looking at resilience as being something not that you do just to avoid something disastrous happens, but that actually being the opportunity to do something really incredible. Building the food resilience, the energy resilience of the place where you live is something which, if done in the right spirit, is an enormous uh, opportunity. And uh, a while ago, I, I spoke to people in Pasadena, where they have a great transition group. They have Caltech up the road and NASA, all these techie guys, they do a repair cafe 13 times a year. And all these guys come along and a lot of other people come. So you can bring your iPad or your shoes or your curtains, someone will repair them for nothing. The only condition is, well, they fix them, you sit in the chair opposite them and you tell them a story about your life. So for me, I always hear that story and I think, well, why are they really repairing with something like that? In the same way that in the urban agriculture projects, what are we really growing? In projects like that we're building resilience but at the same time we're starting to really connect things back together again and for me what's so interesting at the moment is how the language we use in transition is so similar to the language that's been used in public health you know we have an epidemic of loneliness uh, we have epidemic levels of boredom you know there's how, how do we start to piece all this back together again so the second one is about uh, inclusivity social justice uh, for me one of the key bits that we do in transition is to say it's not enough anymore just to expect that we can change uh, the world to the extent that we need with everybody being volunteers. Often there's this <coughs> purist volunteer, I call it the tyranny of volunteerism. Mm -hmm. This idea that actually we can do everything with volunteers, we meet on a Wednesday evening uh, and they'll be able to do it. Actually, I don't think that's possible. And, and we need to be creating livelihoods for this, we need to be creating jobs for this. We have a big strand of what happens in transition that we call re-economy, which is about saying, how do you take those ideas and actually create new community energy companies, new food businesses? And we see a real flowering of that, which is really exciting. And the third one is about subsidiarity, that idea that, 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 that you want things to, decisions to be taken as close to the ground as possible. I work with Transition Network, which is set up to support this, but our role is just to support the, the, the national hubs. There are now 35 countries that have a national transition organisation. Their role is to support the, the regional hubs that self-organise underneath them. Their role is to support the people on the group, on, on the ground, or the, in, the initial, in the initiatives. And the role of those transition initiatives is to act as a kind of project support for the people who are actually doing things. So we sometimes call it a duocracy. You know, the, the push for doing stuff is, it is happening for the people who are on the ground doing it. We pay attention to balance. It's something that we think is really important. There is often this kind of, and I'm sure many of you have seen it, maybe have experienced it. This is the classic activist model of go, 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 collapse with burnout, get up again, keep going, collapse with burnout, and this sort of burnout activist cycle that, that just goes round and round. And paying as much attention to how we do things in our groups as what we do uh, is really, really important. So a lot of stuff in transition is about training groups to be able to hold meetings that people actually enjoy that make decisions that are, that, that, that are good fun, and then we build in time to celebrate and to acknowledge uh, the, the, the things that we've achieved. We create a, an experimental learning network. Nobody knows how to do this. So that requires a culture where we celebrate failure, 
as culture where we celebrate the fact that people take risks, that people try things out. One of the ways, aspects of that is with local currency. I was just in France the other day. This is the local currency from Lyon. This is the local currency from Strasbourg. Every one of these that does this learns from the previous ones and does them slightly different. And you have a real time living experiment happening in hundreds and hundreds of places. That's how we figure this stuff out, I think, not by centralizing how we do things. Uh, we freely share ideas and power. We, we, we give stuff away, we create stuff bringing in as many voices as possible into how we create them. We just made a thing called The Essential Guide to Doing Transition, an online free guide about how to do it. It's been translated into lots of languages, people just picking it up, adapting their own versions, putting their own national stories in. And we look for synergies and, and collaboration where possible. And so the Transition Network is part of Ecolees and other sorts of networks like that. But on the ground, in, in local groups, it's those synergies that are the, the really fascinating bit for me. In my town, Totnes, where I left, that I left very, very early this morning on the train, uh, we have a great project they call Caring Town Totnes, which brings together all the different 70 organisations in the town that provide care in some way, who are all being hit by austerity, gets them all in the same room, what we call the power to convene in transition, that you can get all those people in a room, get a different kind of conversation happening. They're now setting up a kind of a one-stop uh, shop where you can go and find out what services you need. They're all working together much more collaboratively. But it's not a transition town project. It doesn't have that stamp on it. We kind of coordinate it, facilitate it, but just sort of step back and let it happen. Uh, and then things like the Local Entrepreneur Forum, these great ideas for how you do community-supported enterprise where people come together to, to, to battle these things from happening. You create these amazing networks of different people who are working together and supporting each other. Lastly, we foster positive visioning and creativity. And um, that idea of creating a vision of, of, of the rapid transition, how do we create a rapid transition if we can't imagine it ahead of us? It's like if we can throw a sort of a vision whirlpool in front of us that then starts to attract us towards it, it's much more exciting. So, uh, and again, to quote David Fleming, he said, if we are to create a sequel to the market economy, it will above all be a work of the imagination. And, and with that being the case, a lot of what transition does, you know, we can do it, we can imagine that all sorts of futures we like on our own at home, but when we get together with other people in spaces like this, that's really where the magic happens. So, and there are fewer and fewer of those spaces where people come together to imagine together. So that's one of the things I think transition does beautifully, uh, is to create those spaces where people are invited to come together and say, actually, how could it be? It could be really fantastic. So Transition Southampton, close to here, they do this great thing called Imagine Southampton, which involves loads of people coming together and to, and to really look forward and imagine how that could be. Mm -hmm. How am I doing, Mr. Chairman? Uh, 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 oh, I'm over. Okay, I can summarise. This seven minutes is not good. So, uh, so, are we where we want to be? No, we're not. Are we where we wanted to be when we started Transition so, uh, ten years ago? No, we're not. But it's not, but it's pretty amazing because we never thought it would even work in my town. So, so in, in, in that regard, I think it's doing pretty well. Um, uh, one of the, some of the learnings that we have, firstly, is that it requires some really stubborn people. You don't need everybody in a group, but you need a few people in a transition group who are like, this is this is what I'm going to be doing for the next ten years. This is I'm, I'm gonna, I want to I want to really make something happen. Then other people come and go, and that's okay. But you need a core of really stubborn people. That's what really makes projects move. I think. Um, uh, I think we increasingly need to base what we do around around needs, the needs that are identified by the people around us, rather than the needs that we identify. So in in, in Tottenham, we're creating affordable housing. We're creating affordable food systems community energy systems. So how can we meet those, those, those needs in different ways? Uh, how can we use the power to convene, to get people into a room together? It's really important, I think, when we do transition at the local level that we avoid party politics. Uh, and we work very, very hard to, to get people to take those hats off, leave them at the door when they come into transition. It needs to be a really broad church for everybody. Those, those, those conversations are as important as anything else. Key projects take a long time. The big energy projects, the big, the big building projects, but there's a huge amount you can do without <coughs> You can start tomorrow. Often around local food, <coughs> those projects, if people can start to see the world around them changing, you can start tomorrow. And lastly, I think we need to tell better stories. <coughs> a lot of what we do in transition is about hearing stories from one place, taking it to another place, cross-pollinating with stories. And I love the idea of thinking of a project and thinking, how could this be something that somebody in the pub will say, you won't believe what they're doing down in Brighton, they're doing da, 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 da. How can we have the projects that have that sort of really sticky, uh, inspiring sort of story quality to them? Thank you.
Thank you very much. I've heard that before, but I, I was hanging on his every word to such a degree that I stopped looking at the clock. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the question about imagination, that, that quote, the other quote that seemed to define the last few years about it being easier to imagine the end of the world than a change to the current economic system, is fundamentally disproved by what's happening um, in, in, in transition. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Wally Collisby. Yeah. I've had a long train journey as well, so I can stand up. But is rapidly transitioning into a sort of big flat square. So, <laughs> <laughs> up. Um, so I'm based in the history department, in the history department of Bristol. So the approach I've taken to this, this challenge, this provocation today, is, is to look at some historical examples of rapid transition. Uh, rapid transitions are nothing new, taking the long historical view. Um, as the quote goes, you know, history is one damn thing after another. Um, and transitions illustrate that over time societies have coped with really quite extraordinary levels of change. Um, my own period is the 19th century, um, a period of enormous population growth. Uh, so the population of, of England grew by 56% across the 19th century, and Scotland by 50%. And societies coped very rapidly, not always in particularly wholesome ways, as we'll go into, but very rapidly with this kind of level of, of, of rapid transition. Um, there's an absolutely fantastic African proverb uh, which goes, until lions have their own historians, histories of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So I suppose if there's a take home message from this today, it's that we need lion historians amongst us uh, to take examples, historical examples of rapid transitions and apply them to some of the predicaments that we have today. Um, so, at the beginning of the 19th century, there was only one city in England that had a population of over 100,000, um, and that was London. Um, by the end of the 19th century, several had passed that mark. Famously, um, in the textile districts of the North of England, Bradford, Manchester, cities like that were growing between 5 and 10 percent a year. Now, these may not seem enormous numbers to us um, as we are sort of acclimatised to mega cities and global cities, but a community like Bradford going from 16,000 to 100,000 within the space of a very few years had an enormous impact on the societies and communities there. Brighton, since I like to use sort of low key specific examples, in 1801 was 7,000 and by 1901 had a population of 120,000. So an enormous amount of infrastructure had to be produced and created. Now we can't glamorise the life of the average migrant to a city in the 19th century. Life was dirty, dangerous, uncomfortable. Um, average populations in a city like Brighton would have been 11, 12 people living in a room <coughs> of, of sort of 10, 10 foot by 12 foot. So it was grim. But one thing it did inspire, I think, um, mass living, the new experience of mass living, um, <coughs> all sorts of possibilities for new kinds of political organising, political thinking, and phenomenal levels of associational activity. One of the reasons I love studying the 19th century is that there is an association formed for just about anything you can you care to, to imagine. So even, even clubs associated uh, for, for saving up to buy face powder, the ladies, you know, so every single thing, you pluck anything out of the air, I guarantee I'll be able to find you an associational group that was founded um, to make it happen. Um, actually, an early, uh, early example for the environment movement, I and mean, the reason we enjoy so many parks these days, Queen's Park, Crescent Park here in Brighton, or ones in common, was because one of the associational societies founded in the 19th century was to protect the commons, and I think it's quite interesting that they use that language and retain that language around the commons as well. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of specific examples for Brighton, since we're in Brighton today, and then look at how communities did culturally adapt to the enormous social changes that were happening around them. Uh, Brighton, we all know, was a place and a site of leisure and pleasure, a spa town where the wealthy came to disport themselves, but it was also an important industrial centre and also um, a very important centre for the birth of the cooperative movement. So we do associate the cooperative movement with the Rochdale pioneers in the 1840s, but in fact Brighton was already pioneering cooperativism um, in the 1820s. Because trade unions weren't legal until the 1870s, um, groups of working people used to gather and find other ways in which they could mutually support 
um, support each other financially or with foodstuffs or, or, or medical care or so on. And the cooperative movement was extremely important in this in the early days, sort of does have its roots with the early union movement from that perspective. And so Brighton's workers were absolutely at the forefront of the cooperative movement. And uh, the very first <coughs> cooperative newspaper called The Cooperator was founded in 1828. Um, William King, who was a local GP, um, founded and supported the newspaper. It only lasted two short years, but it was extremely influential, and the paper was sold across the whole country. Um, in fact, it, it inspired uh, one of the pieces of research I've been working on um, at the moment. is a bank run by a woman in Southwark called Eliza McCarthy, um, and it was a sort of very early time bank, essentially. It was a sort of socialist bank where she invited people to come and trade skills and goods as well as, as, well as money. She was a really fascinating person. Um, so cooperation was, was really central to Dr. King's philosophy. Um, he advised that radicals and activists could not cut themselves off from society, but had to form societies within society. To start with, a shop um, was in itself a radical act, because we all have necessities, he believes. So to start with a shop was actually okay, it's a consumer model, but we all have necessities, and you could actually consume on a kind of cooperative and community-based level. Um, he, um, his, his newspaper, The Corporator, I think this is kind of a wonderful quite nice strap line for today, actually. Um, knowledge and union are power. Power directed by knowledge is happiness. Happiness is the end of creation. Um, so our own shop, he wrote, can extend credit and know its community. Um, and uh, there are several accounts in the 19th century of, of communities being absolutely reliant on these kind of cooperative store models. So a famous study of the Rothschild buildings in London in the 19th century, um, and here's a quote from, from one of the residents. Many hundreds of families would come to the workhouse long before they do, especially in hard winters, but for those small cooperatives giving them credit for the bare necessities of life, and thus tiding them over the pinching time. A lot of working class financial support came through the development of these sorts of localised and socialised cooperative schemes. Um, in 1902, a study conducted by Sydney Dart found that many schemes were run by publicans and licensed grocers working within their communities. These included things like goose clubs and Christmas clubs and drinking clubs and all kinds of ways of kind of mutualising um, saving and spending within, within sort of very limited means. Um, one, of, one of my favourite examples um, was a weather club um, which, uh, in which a group would agree to, um, to take a week from a Friday to a Friday and each day if it rained during the whole 24 hours pay a penny, for a, for a fog they would pay two pence, for snow three pence and for a thunderstorm four pence and then this amount was kind of shared out equitably at the end of the week after then so it was sort of just a structured way of saving together but quite fun as well. Um, as I said, clubs existed for almost anything, buying chocolate, buying children's toys, buying bigger ticket items that were often hard on very restricted budgets like school uniforms or coal, um, and, and often had a sort of very strong mutual aid or philanthropic um, element to them. And I think this kind of transactional mutualism that you see was absolutely core to kind of working class strategies for surviving on very precarious budgets. So take something like the Sunday suit, um, from Monday to Saturday, it was a completely idle asset. So what you can either do is lend it to a neighbour who had to go to a funeral or something, or you could pawn it, and then you could, you could reclaim it on Saturday night in time for Sunday when you could wear it to the pub or the chapel, depending on what your, or both, depending on what your proclivities were. Um, and I think that is kind of an interesting model because it makes us really scrutinise stuff and the idea of assets as idle, and how those are kind of distributed and shared within community and how they're put to work differently. I think it kind of potentially revolutionises our relationship to stuff. But working class organising didn't just confine itself to things. Um, and Caroline was talking earlier this morning about sort of joy in politics and organising and communal activity. Um, and one of my favourite examples of that from the 19th century is the, the Clarion movement. Um, which was founded by Robert Blatchford, a journalist in Manchester in the late 19th century. And the Clarion was a newspaper initially. Um, it was actually the, the most successful left-wing newspaper that has ever been produced in this country. It had a, a huge, huge reach. But it also became a series of clubs as well. 
So there was a women's group, there were children's societies, there was a theatre group, uh, all kinds of different growing groups, food growing groups. There really is nothing under the sun. It was a kind of transition avant la lettre. But the famous one, probably some of you may have heard of, was the Clarion Cycling Clubs. And there are still a few Clarion Cycling Clubs in existence, although they seem to be a bit divested of their political aspect these days. And the Clarion Cycling Clubs were founded on the fact that they thought working class people should have access to the open air to the countryside, they should be fit and healthy, and, and they could go out and be joyful and, and cycle. You know, they did politics, they took the paper with them, they would do readings in village pubs and things, but but they but they, they, they also had fun while doing it. Um, there's a the newspaper is actually fantastic. You can you can access quite a lot of it online these days. Um, but um, the clarion clubs across the country would sort of help each other out. So um, I found an example um, from August in 1897. The Birmingham branch was having difficulties with its subscription, so they couldn't take the children out enough on their bikes. They didn't have the resources to take the kids out. So they put a sort of call out in the Clarion newspaper, and all of the other Clarions would then send money to Birmingham so that they could get the kids out on their bikes again. So it was a sort of very um, flat structure, devolved. They communicated very rapidly through the newspaper. Um, all the Clarions had an annual Easter get together. I found a fantastic example um, from uh, Ivan's Bath, from the Bath Clarion, um, where uh, the guys had sort of set off to join the, um, to join the, uh, the, the Easter gathering, in, which was in Bakewell that year. They reported back to their local newspaper that they got there in two in the morning, so they'd cycled all the way from the southwest up to Bakewell. And one of them had done the whole thing on a penny farthing, um, which I think is pretty extraordinary. Um, just to end, I'm probably massively over time. Um, uh, there was a fundraiser in, in South, for the South London Clarion Group. Um, they went to, um, now if anyone knows what this is, in fact, please do shout out, a Bohemian smoking concert. And the <laughs> circus, and entertainments included a Miss Rosa Dallow, the one and only Peyton, and this is the bit that really intrigued me, I have to say, the Social Democratic Foundation's Quintet. And for those of you who don't know, the Social Democratic Foundation was the first socialist party founded in this country before the Labour Party in the 1880s. And I just had this mind-bending, could you imagine these days, you know, a political party having its own quintet and, uh, and performing at a bohemian smoking party. <laughs> that is the joy that politics is lacking. Um, that actually it was celebratory, it was participatory, it was fun, um, it was associated with all sorts of other activities, not just boring manifesto pledges and so on. Um, so I think that's what it shows us, that politics, working people, grassroots politics could be fun, could be engaging, informative, and a whole philosophy of community, engagement, support for working people, organised by working people, for working people. And in terms of the broader message for today, um, I think it shows us that communities are more than capable of organising, adapting, sharing, even when their personal circumstances are incredibly precarious. Achieving change or transition requires enabling cultures, that are based on mutualism and understanding and doing things together. And uh, the radical historian Peter Leinbau emphasises that human beings um, change owing to circumstances, owing to one another. If there's one thing we can learn from history, it's that we don't just change as we please. It takes agitation, education and organisation. live stream Molly or Melvin Bragg any day of the week you know, and take up the whole program. Um, I like, I like the, 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 not, not just the erudition but the kind of the um, decorating your comments with lovely throwaway Admiral Electra type phrases, that's a kind of subtle anti-Brexit message. And actually the Bohemian smoking contest, Peter was just telling me about what he had with his bag just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you all about it. Now as a, as a little counterpoint um, uh, to see what we might learn from whole other ways of organising. We're going to hear from Jack. Jack. Yes. So I'm going to talk about agitation, but not very much joy. Um, uh, my case study that I want to discuss today is uh, the, the American Tea Party, the Tea Party Caucus. And taking a slightly different approach, we're here to talk, to talk about large-scale change. But I want to talk about how this tiny, fringe group of Americans 
is less than 10% of the population, has managed to um, bogart a national election to change global conversations on what being conservative means and to bring out an entire unknown hidden population uh, within the US uh, into the political framework. And I want to talk about what kind of lessons can we learn from the Tea Party and apply them to climate activism? How can we take a page out of their own book? Um, so the Tea Party strategy, I've only got seven minutes, so we can talk about it more during the break, but it was essentially the famous Scotch Pool and her um, doctoral student Williams did a great book on the subject, looking at this iron trio of three main strategies that the Tea Party used. Local activism, billionaire support, largely the Koch brothers, and um, they fed the media candy. They just plugged them with media candy that got them, uh, that really enlarged their voice. Let's talk a little bit about this local activism. They really used local town halls. I wish the MP was still here to talk a little bit about um, you know, the, the, the short election cycles, particularly that US Congress people face. And so they were basically always campaigning. And this is a real chink in the American Democratic armor. Well, there's a lot of chinks in the armor. But, um, but this is one of them. And, and the, the Tea Party really exploited that and said, you know what, we're going to take every single one of your speaking opportunities as a chance to bring up our very narrow and focused agenda, which is fiscal conservatism, individual liberty, and that the government should only be as big as the Constitution narrowly, narrowly defined uh, allows the government to be. And that is actually the piece that I think distinguishes the Tea Party from the, uh, the left side of environmental activism, is this narrow, crystal clear focus and a willingness to embrace anyone that comes into their fold. And that means that if you're racist, if you're part of the Ku Klan, if you are a pedophile, if you're anything that believes in those three principles of Tea Party, of the Tea Party caucus, you are embraced and that leads to people who had been otherwise, quote unquote, oppressed or silenced coming out of the woodwork and feeling that they had a political safe space to espouse their views. Um, and so this is the Tea Party strategy in a nutshell, as I see it. And now let's talk about the global environmental pol problems that I really care about, these super wicked problems. Um, Peter Newell brought, brought up wicked problems. I'm talking about super wicked problems as defined by Ben Shore and Steve Bernstein. They are characterized by four features. Time is running out. There is no central authority to solve the problem and a related feature. Those who want to solve the problem are actually part of the problem. Right? We all took, used fossil fuels to get here today. It's a little bit like the self-help gurus who try to help us get over our addiction to the internet, using the internet to teach us how to do it. Um, and then a tendency to vastly discount the future, a tendency to vastly believe that the future will, will be cheerier than it really is. And these super wicked problems are really hard to solve, um, particularly, and the literature on super wicked problems shows that global one-shot solutions um, tend to fail or to be very dilute precisely because of this governance issue, this intrinsic governance issue where those who are trying to regulate, themse to, to regulate the problem are also regulating themselves. So this runs a little counter to the, to the workshop theme, but, but not too much because I'm going to talk about the power of incremental change. Um, and as a way to illustrate um, what, how these super wicked problems are that, that the most effective, durable solutions um, for super wicked problems are actually incremental. I want to talk a little bit about my experience moving to London. You can hear from my voice that I'm, you know, from Trump land, from, from New York, where nobody in my neighborhood voted for him. But um, so here I am in London. I've been here for five weeks. And we moved into a house, and there's a ton of stuff from the people that were in there before. And the trash collectors will only come once every two weeks. And this is a ratcheting up from my days as a, as a London School of Economics student when recycling was just coming online and I remember we were just getting compost boxes. But it shows this incremental shift where I guess now recycling is so commonplace and composting is so commonplace that Herringay decided let's only collect rubbish once every two weeks. And it's been really, really difficult for my family. We like filled that trash bin up in the first you know, couple days, cleaning out the house. We had to call the dump, we had to pay extra money. And I believe that I'm an environmentalist. I believe that I'm a pretty serious environmentalist. And I was pushed beyond my comfort zone 
by regulation to be a better environmentalist than I was willing to be. And I consider myself a radical. And that is an example how something incremental and small can ratchet up to actually push behavioral change beyond where I would, left to my own individual devices, regulate myself. And that is a sign of hope. Um, there's other examples where I think of incremental change really becoming sticky and entrenched. You can look at milk subsidies. I don't care how right-wing a Tea Party member is, I'm sure they do not want to pay more for milk, eggs, and bread, highly subsidized commodities in the US and in most industrialized countries. We get used to these subsidies, you don't opt in to pay more for your basic goods. And so there are ways in which policies can develop and can expand the population that supports them, regardless of where they think they are on the political spectrum. Um, so this is to say that Paris is well and good. I've actually worked quite hard on, the, on supporting a um, strong Paris Agreement, but that we might also want to pursue multiple incremental policies that are, one, difficult to reverse, two, lead to entrenchment, like subsidies, three, expand the population of people that are invested in the policy. And this is where the Tea Party is very, very good in terms of expanding the population of people that, are, that consider themselves part of their caucus through a radical acceptance of anyone that meets their narrow principles. And finally, to reframe the policy conversation. So these four aspects basically speak about influence and durability. I'm not convinced that the Tea Party actually has a durable influence. I think that they've done quite well in terms of expanding the population that identifies with them and reframing the conversation, and that already is quite, um, has made quite an impact. But in terms of their durability, because they don't have any actual policy ideas, they you know, crashed and burned with um, Obamacare, and you can see that. So I think that that's where we as environmentalists can come in. We can learn from them. Um, we can learn to, from them about reframing the policy conversation, about expanding the population that, that, um, that identifies as, an as, as part of the climate change group. Um, but we can also work where they have failed in terms of actually thinking about policy innovations that are incre incremental, difficult to reverse, and that will lead to entrenchment. Um, also, Speaking to, to Scotch Pole's idea about this triumvirate of the um, of influence, so media candy, local activism, and um, billionaire friends. We've got that, right? We've got Soros, we've got Branson, we've got Gates on our side, we've got the galvanized local activists. They were galvanized by Obamacare, I'm galvanized by Trump. But, and, and we also have the ability to, to make media candy, just like I think actually Greenpeace probably identified that tactic. But what we don't have is a very clear and narrow policy agenda, and something that would accept um, uh, allegiances of strange bedfellows into the fold, a willingness to be absolutely flexible on anything except for three main points. Um, so what we need is a laser-focused agenda and to pursue incremental institutional changes that become impossible to reverse, that can only ratchet up because they expand the population that has vested interest in their success over time which, by the way, is definitely running out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely fascinating. I've just learned for the very first time that I've got billionaire friends. So <laughs> I, I, I see huge potential. Uh, so just to kind of finish off this session uh, of contributions to feed our own reflections and conversations, we're going to hear from Phil. OK, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the Science Policy uh, Research Unit here at the University of Sussex. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, the, the role of the state in transitions, but more specifically, it's really going to be quite UK focused, and I'm going to be looking at uh, the, the culture of the state in the UK and how that uh, can perhaps be transformed. And um, to sort of introduce this, this has really come out of um, research I've been doing, uh, which has been looking at UK energy policy, and more specifically, uh, looking at some of the idiosyncrasies of UK energy policy. So the, the first part of my talk is going to be a little bit negative, but I'll finish on the positives. Uh, so um, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, the UK political culture sometimes in recent years tends to do things uh, that the rest of Europe don't. 
And uh, this is true for energy policy as well. Um, one of the main things is that, uh, unlike uh, the rest of Europe, uh, the UK has committed to the most ambitious nuclear new build uh, programme of any country in the developed world. Uh, supposed 16 gigawatts of new nuclear power, uh, which uh, is on a scale that no other country is attempting. Only a handful of other countries are really trying this kind of thing, China, Russia, USA. Um, so really, our, our research began to think about, well, why is the UK doing this? And uh, especially when we look at a country like Germany, which we did, uh, which phased out uh, nuclear, uh, or made the policy to phase out nuclear by 2022 after Fukushima. And from where I come from, from sort of innovation studies, uh, if you compare the two countries, Germany and the UK, um, and you look at them in terms of the strength of the industry, the performance of the nuclear power plant, the renewable resource that each country has, what you'll see is that it should be the UK that should be phasing out nuclear power and Germany that continues based on these conventional criteria. Because unfortunately the UK has got historically one of the worst performing nuclear industries in Europe. It doesn't have a new build industry anymore. It has one of the best renewables resources, or indeed the best renewables resource in Europe, uh, better than Germany. So the point I'm trying to make is on these conventional criteria, uh, <coughs> this comparison and these decisions don't make sense. So how can we understand this divergence in political culture? And uh, it comes down to two factors that we've looked at which are interconnected. And uh, this is the, the democratic culture, uh, it, and as Caroline was saying, you know, if you look at uh, Germany, it has a proportional uh, s system of voting. It's had a Green Party in the Bundestag since 1985. Uh, the UK uh, differs in this uh, quite strongly uh, until 2010 that Caroline was first in, I think. Um, so, so this first past the post versus the proportional is quite important for the kind of voices you get in the institutional landscape of politics in these two countries. An uncomfortable fact, because nuclear is you know, low carbon and so on, um, we, we, we don't particularly like to talk about this fact. Um, uh, when we look at Germany or Denmark, we say, well, they really promoted renewables and there was niches and they really made an effort to do this. And we kind of don't want to ignore the obvious point that um, would this really have been possible without a huge democratic protest movement against a very large centralised technology in the late 70s and 80s, uh, which essentially uh, closed down the particular option of, of nuclear power? I don't know. It's a hypothetical question. Uh, we, you know, if, if we could turn back time, maybe Denmark and Germany would have really pushed for renewables if they'd also been trying to build 16 gigawatts of nuclear power. We don't know, but I think it's quite unlikely. So there's these cultural conditions which I think are, are quite important. And uh, in 2015, there was a famous um, uh, a moment really where there was a policy reset uh, in, in the UK. Um, many uh, policies directed at renewables, which were doing very well, the growth between 2010 and 2015, phenomenal, uh, but the solar subsidies were vastly reduced. Onshore wind, uh, energy efficiency uh, policies were reduced. At the same time, fracking uh, strongly promoted, and uh, a deal with the Chinese done the promotion of small modular reactors, despite uh, this uh, very um, uh, poorly performing nuclear power. So again, this counterintuitive ten. Al Gore and the UN chief scientist were puzzled by this decision that the UK made. They said the rest of the world is moving towards a renewables-based future and the UK seems to be doing something else. Um, why this entrenchment of this particular technology uh, in relation to nuclear power? Uh, we've written a lot about this and um, it is very difficult to understand when you see that the costs are lower with renewables and the, the industry worldwide is in complete crisis. Uh, all these kind of things in the UK has this immense potential for renewables it is difficult to understand uh, why there is this persistence. The conclusion we've come to is there is indeed a lot of evidence uh, to suggest uh, that there are pressures in relation to sustaining skills and expertise related to uh, Britain being able to build 
nuclear power submarines that would otherwise <coughs> not be possible unless you also have a large scale civilian program. The papers are out there and we can talk about this and I can give you the details because there's not enough time to go into the evidence. But what the point to take away from this is that in terms of the UK state, the entrenchment of certain power relations are often much deeper than we think. They often don't necessarily relate to energy technologies. They can relate to bigger cultural factors. In this case, the UK's uh, tendency to want to be top table, Empire 2.0, um, having a, this nuclear weapons system and being one of the big boys. And uh, there are these bigger cultural factors to do with the state that impact this. Now, uh, and there's a democratic problem here as well, as Caroline touched upon. The UK is one of the most centralised uh, uh, democracies in Europe. Um, it's very unequal. The first past the post really doesn't work anymore. We're in a multi-party system uh, without a voting uh, system to cater for this. Uh, we need regional um, democracy. If you look at Denmark and Germany, the ability to make decisions at the regional level about industrial policy and economic policy was an incredibly important factor in forwarding uh, the energy transitions in the 80s and 90s. Unfortunately, the UK, when we've had regional development agencies and so on, they've been uh, centralised, as they were in 2010, as Margaret Thatcher did in the 1980s. So, the positives. <laughs> despite all of the, uh, the difficulties that we're seeing in the UK, despite um, the, the, the fact that perhaps renewables aren't getting the support that they deserve, in enacting a rapid transition. Incredible things have happened and we've heard about the coal free day the other day and the immense growth of renewables and so on. Um, despite what we we're told, the lights haven't gone out even though Hinkley C hasn't been built. So uh, that's uh, a good plan and perhaps it will be built by 2025. Um, I, I would probably bet against that. But the thing is, despite these kind of strange decisions that the UK state makes, incredible things are happening. We heard about it at the community level and from the grassroots, and um, so that's an important thing. So in terms of the role of the state, um, I really like your point about the strange bedfellows there. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about recently is that there's, the, is there's a key actor uh, that is often not talked about, certainly in the literatures I engage with, and maybe it's just because I'm an academic, and I've not really uh, noticed these things. But from the readings I've done around and the research I've done around Denmark, a key aspect to uh, the transitions in the 80s and 90s, Denmark had a very strong shipbuilding industry that was crumbling. A key thing that was done at this point was to put the renewables industry, manufacturing industry, in the communities of the declining shipbuilding industry. And who did you get on side? You got the trade unions on side, you got workers on side. They became part of the transition. In the UK, I feel something that could be done better is that there needs to be more conversations in the trade union movement and with trade unions, because they've got an immense capacity to organize, and uh, there's an immense opportunity for jobs and so on that may be unleashed with uh, the conversations around industrial strategy. And there are conversations around the just transition taking place in the TUC and all these kinds of things. And I think that's a real positive. And I know I've run out of time, but just one last point um, I'd like to make is that obviously this is an important time in terms of UK democracy. Um, and I come back to the point of regional democracy, regional change. Uh, I'm, I'm not partisan on uh, the issue of Scotland and what it, it, it is doing. Um, but if you look at it in, an, in neutral terms of what it can provoke in terms of democratic change, I think that the devolution movement and the kind of politics you see out there, what we don't hear about down here is in the independence debate, just an incredible cultural debate about what kind of society should we have, horizontal organisations, the Commonweal, uh, Bella Caledonia, people going and knocking on doors like the Tea Party did in neighbourhoods that had never voted for a long time in Glasgow, some of the poorest communities in Europe, and they were actively engaged in politics, and those conversations still take place. And whether independence is good or bad, new kinds of conversations are happening, and I think that's quite exciting in promoting a democratic disruption uh, for the UK in general, towards more devolution in England as well. That I think is crucial for rapid transformation. So, well, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, but, but, but that's a more
more of that as we go through the day. Um, it's really fascinating to hear, though, because I, I, I remember from early days of looking at the, the growth of the nuclear industry in the UK, how it was always the line that there was this sort of seamless web between the military and the civil side, but, but that was something that seemed to have kind of fallen from, from, from the debate. So to hear you saying that this is one of the uh, things which it explains the seemingly illogical path dependency of the, uh, of the industry. Absolutely fascinating. Now we've got about um, we've got a good half hour, just over half an hour for um, any other contributions. Um, you, you can.